Unfortunately, one reality that all of us come to know as wrestling fans is that we get used to the news of some wrestler dying. It is just a part of the wrestling culture. It's something we come to expect. It's something we come to dread. Like, I'll give you a perfect example of the reality of being a wrestling fan. Uh, several weeks back, when the announcement was made that Kurt Angle was going to be the headline inductee for the 2017 WWE Hall of Fame class, I actually saw him trending, and I was worried because I thought it was more ominous bad news. Because it seems like as much as anything, that's the only time that wrestlers trend now is when somebody passes away or somebody gets into some really, really naughty trouble. So, like I said, it, it sucks. And I think sometimes it's what forces us as wrestling fans to kind of take a step back and not be as fully emotionally invested as we once were, especially us older fans that have seen, frankly, a lot of our heroes, a lot of our legends pass away. They're no longer with us. Now, not every wrestler dies due to um, unfortunate circumstances. Not every wrestler dies due to self-inflicted wounds, steroid abuse, drug abuse, alcoholism, things like that. You know, there are guys that are able to overcome the environment of professional wrestling, guys that are able to live a full, complete life and a damn full, complete, and full life, and really grab life by the nutsack and uh, drain it for every last ounce of seed that it possibly can. And when I look at somebody who was able to do that, um, I think of Jim Myers, also known to many wrestling fans as George the Animal Steel. George the Animal Steel passed away this week at the age of 79 to kidney failure. And I've got to say, you know, for somebody like me that grew up in the 80s, you know, it, it, it affects me quite a bit. Um, maybe some of you that are newer fans, you know who he was. You can appreciate or respect who he was, but you didn't necessarily get to live it. You didn't get to understand. You didn't get to appreciate it. You know, and I, I think... Jim Myers' story is fascinating. You're talking about a guy that got a bachelor's degree from Michigan State and I believe a master's in teaching from Central Michigan. He was a high school teacher in the Detroit area, a coach. And then in the late 60s, he decided he wanted to supplement his income. Now think about this. During the off season of the school year, he wanted to supplement his income by becoming a professional wrestler. I believe he first broke into the business in the 60s in the Detroit area, wrestling under a mask. He was called the student and his manager was Playboy Gut Gary Hart. To go from that to being a part of WrestleMania and the early growth of the WWF from a territorial type of company into an international media conglomerate, you know, it's just fascinating to think of. And even for me, somebody that is a bit older than many of you watching this video, I didn't even get to see the George the Animal Steel that was the villainous guy back in the 60s and 70s, the scary dude, the dude that would sit there and do all types of dirty, low-down crap in order to try and get some type of competitive edge over his opponent. I got to see the fun part of George the Animal Steel. I got to see George the Animal Steel be a cartoon character come to life. And when I think of George the Animal Steel, I think about my childhood and, you know, a childhood that I don't always think of as being all that happy. I think about people like George the Animal Steel, and I'm eternally grateful for some of the positive memories that they give me. You know, here's a guy that had this bald head, kind of a Humpty Dumpty looking dude, uh, hair all over his freaking body. And, and it's fascinating to me that when I think of George the Animal Steel, I think of the true epitome of being a wrestling talent. Maybe not necessarily a great in-ring wrestler, but how much is that really worth anyways? Especially in those days, it didn't necessarily have to be worth a whole lot of anything. You know, here was a guy that was a character. He was a persona. He was a personality. And he was a hell of a one at that. And what's interesting to me is as effective in the 60s and the 70s as he was as a heel wrestling Bruno Sammartino and people all throughout the WWF at the time, 
and throughout the territories of the country, he became an even bigger star and legend in the 80s as kind of this cartoonish, lovable uh, George the Animal Steel. So he was able to go to the complete opposite ends of the wrestling spectrum. He became one of the most feared villains in the wrestling business of the 1970s to being one of the most lovable, sympathetic baby faces of the 1980s. I mean, it's astounding. You have a lot of people, legends in the history of the wrestling business, that could really only play to one side of the fence. And whenever you were asking them to truly play to the other side, they just couldn't do it. It just wasn't quite the same. I think of Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, a wonderful baby face and a wonderful talent. One of the best true in-ring performers of all time. A, a star, a superstar, a megastar. But he was always kind of limited in terms of the fact that he could really only work on the baby side uh, of the fence. He could only be a baby face. He couldn't be a heel. It just wouldn't be natural. It just wouldn't work. Conversely, I think of a guy like Ric Flair, another superstar, huge megastar, icon, one of the greats of all time, uh, one of the greatest in-ring performers of all time in terms of his consistency, his durability, his longevity. Even later on in his career, when he kind of became a parody of himself, it still doesn't take away the fact from me that Ric Flair was great in his time. But to me, he was always best as a heel and doing heel things. When you asked him to go to the babyface side of the fence, he could kind of do it because he was just that talented. He was just that much of a personality. He was just that much of a character, both in real life and then on television and in the ring. But he was always better suited to be a heel. And that's where the most money was to be made. With George Steele in the 70s, you made a bunch of money with him in the territories as a heel and a monster. And in the 80s, you made a ton of money with him as a babyface and a monster. And I look at a guy like George Steele, and I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for a guy that recognizes where the business is going, and he embraces it. He takes hold of something, makes the most of it, and makes it work, and gets it over like a million bucks. And that's exactly what he did. You know, the story that he's told and has been told throughout the years about in the 80s where he was cutting one of his uh, promos and it was eloquent, as it usually was whenever Jim Myers would speak. You know, this is a guy with a master's degree. He knew how to communicate. But he's sitting there trying to cut a regular promo. Vince McMahon says something to the effect that's not what they want. He sounds too much like a regular guy. He doesn't sound like much of an animal, much of a monster. So he starts sitting there and saying, the, duh, 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 you, you go, that type of stuff. And Vince is like, Eureka, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I'm looking for. So George the Animal Steel took this thing that frankly pissed him off because he wanted to cut one style of promo and prided himself for years on cutting one style of promo. Here's Vince McMahon sitting there telling him, no, I want you to go in an entirely different direction. He does it just to fuck with Vince. And Vince loves it. And then George the Animal Steel, instead of fighting it, he just goes with it. And he probably made as much money at the tail end of his career when his body was starting to break down a little bit. Because mind you, when he got to the mid-80s, this was a George the Animal Steel that was already in his late 40s. He made as much money then, if not more so, for a variety of reasons, and had as much success as at any point in time in his career. I always think back to George the Animal Steel, and I think back to his feud that really carried on over the course of a year with the Macho Man Randy Savage, WrestleMania II, going all the way on through his affection for Miss Elizabeth to the point where you got to that classic IC title match between Steamboat and Savage at WrestleMania III. While I know George Steele was always kind of pissed off about the fact that he was in his hometown area and he couldn't perform at the Silverdome at WrestleMania III, he was still there, and he was still a critical part of the story. And I, I think back to wrestling back then, and I know it's not necessarily the reality we can ever have now, but I love those larger-than-life characters, those personalities, those guys that could just suck you in and help you suspend your disbelief, the guys that were talented enough to be able to carry a piece of business, a program, a story for not just three months, not just six months, past nine months, past 12 months, over a year. You know, and I think fondly back to the feud and rivalry between Macho Man and George the Animal Steel. Hey, you know, whatever I would see bump into 
old clips on YouTube of stuff he would do, like some of the vignettes he did with um, Gene Okerlund or such and such. It always brought a smile to my face. And that, to me, in a world that is sometimes way too serious, in a world that isn't always fun, that's one of the greatest legacies I can say about anybody, is they put a smile on my face, and they made things fun for me. And that's exactly what George the Animal Steel did for me. A guy who went from being a school teacher in a high school, I think football and basketball and I think wrestling coach too. I'm not, I can't remember what all he coached. But a guy who went from that to being one of the biggest stars of the WWF at a critical juncture in time in the company's history, arguably the most important critical time in their company's history. He became a cartoon star. He became larger than life. He became a household name. He truly did. His impact on professional wrestling, but most certainly the WWF slash WWE, cannot be undersold, cannot be understated. You know, it, it it's just amazing to me to think about, you know, all the fun that I had as a little kid. I love George the Animal Steel. I used to sit there and, you know, <laughs> take the little... <laughs> the couch cushion and I try to bite into it and I try to get all the stuffing to come out like George, I used to see George the Animal Steel do with the turnbuckle <laughs> got, got a little older I tried to eat a bunch of <laughs> Creed mints in order to get my tongue to turn like George Steele's did if I would have known it was freaking Clorettes I would have solved the problem a long time before I never quite figured it out but he did. You know, imitation is the sincerest form, form of flattery. And as a kid, as much as I'm talking about the saying your prayers, doing the training and eating the vitamins, brother, and posing and, you know, acting like the junkyard dog and running around like the ultimate warrior, there I was like George the Animal Steel trying to sit there and chew on a freaking couch cushion. Now, maybe that suggests deeper seated problems for me. Perhaps that's true. But I also think it is an ultimate sign of the impact of my life as a wrestling fan for somebody like George the Animal Steel. Uh, my sympathies go out to his wife, uh, Pat, I believe is her name. They were married for 60 years. Think about that for a second. 60 years. So many marriages that end early. So many people that have all types of marital problems, extramarital affairs, multiple divorces, multiple marriages. This man was able to be married for over 60 years, I think it was. And that's incredible. It's just absolutely astounding. So my sympathies go out to her, uh, the rest of uh, the Myers family. I imagine this is a very tough time. And frankly, you know, it's, a, it's not a fun time for wrestling fans like me. Because George the Animal Steel brought me a lot of happiness as a little kid. He, he, he made wrestling fun for me. It's people like George the Animal Steel, along with several others when I was growing up. The Hogans, the Savages, the Andres, the DiBiases, the Jakes, the JYDs, you know, the Honky Tonk Mans, the Rick Rudes, and so on and so forth. The British Bulldogs, the Heart Foundation, uh, the Road Warriors, Demolition. I could go on and on and on. All the great names of great talent that you had, Mr. Wonderful, um, in the WWF of the 1980s. It's people like them, people like George the Animal Steel, that help mold and shape. And, and this is not to be hyperbole or just, you know, caught up in the moment. BS. it's serious. It's true. It's because of people like George the Animal Steel that I fell in love with professional wrestling. And even all these years later, when I'm not all that entertained by it, when I don't all, always enjoy it all that much, it's that deep-seated loyalty that was sown in me 30 years ago that helps me to try and fight through some of the tougher times in wrestling like what I feel like we're experiencing today. And it's people like George the Animal Steel that helped shape my life. I've been a wrestling fan over 30 years now. Part of the reason I felt passionate enough about wrestling to do wrestling-related videos out on YouTube is because of people like George the Animal Steel. One of the great characters and personality for my money in the history of the professional wrestling business. Somebody that I enjoyed tremendously as a kid. And somebody that I owe an ever indebted uh, debt of gratitude for helping to shape who I am. And who I've been all these years. 
and helping me to experience the joy that can be professional wrestling and helping me to understand how much fun uh, my entertainment should be. God, George the Animal Steel was great. Some of you young bucks and you see what wrestling is today, you know, I, I feel bad for you because you miss out on so much. These guys that didn't have to do a ton, but when they did, man, it mattered. And man, it made a difference. And man, it had impact. And I said, the ability to be a villainous monster, feared and hated and loathed, you know, borderline causing riots in the 70s, to be loved in the 80s and, you know, held up in high esteem as one of the great sympathetic heroes and figures in professional wrestling and in the WWF. I have nothing but good things to say about George the Animal Steel. Um, wherever he is, I hope he is resting peacefully. Um, I hope he went up to that big WrestleMania in the sky where you're going to have Dusty Rhodes and Rowdy Rowdy Piper and the Macho Man Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior and so many other greats over the years. You think about it, though. In 79 years, the man got a lot out of his life. Got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in teaching, was a teacher, was a coach, uh, had a short stint of playing uh, semi-professional football back in the 60s, and he went on to become one of the more legendary wrestlers in the history of the Titan Tower machine. Most of us can only hope, and I most certainly am one of them, can only hope that I could squeeze whatever years I've got left on my life remaining I can squeeze anywhere near the amount of juice out of my life that William Jim Myers, George the Animal Steel did. Rest in peace, animal. You are gone, but you are never forgotten. And I most certainly appreciate you for all the joy and entertainment you brought to me as a wrestling fan as a kid. Because again, it is individuals like you who helped shape the man that I am today. The positive aspects of it anyways.